Hello and welcome to PS on Air, where our leading commentators engage with the newspapers that publish them. Today, I'm joined by Harvard's Joe Nye, who is also a former Assistant Secretary of Defense in the United States and a former chair of the National Intelligence Council. And to talk to him, we have Gaitz Minassian from Le Monde and Yuya Yokoburi from the Japanese newspaper Yomuri Shinbun. There's much that we could talk about, but I think if there's a single connective tissue, it is to do with Donald Trump and his effect on the global order. Joe, maybe we could start with the first question about the recent terrorist attacks, which we've seen in uh, in London and before that in Manchester, and also uh, during in France during the, the presidential elections and and before that, we've seen uh, a lot of outpourings of concern around the world. But one of the things that was very striking was was Donald Trump's reaction to it. Uh, his tweets, which led the, the New Yorker to ask, uh, how low can he stoop? Do you think that the global war on terror could actually create uh, a new culture war between Europe and America uh, today in the same way that it did after 9-11? I doubt that it will be that sharper division because Trump's views are heavily criticized on this inside the United States. So uh, Trump is not America. Uh, he's a it, it is odd that uh, the President of the United States would pick a fight with the Mayor of London about some language taken out of context. Uh, in fact, what's even more odd is Trump did say some things that were presidential of sympathy for Britain, but then he stepped on his own message with this uh, crazy idea that he has to tweet about everything. What does it look like from Paris, guys? Oh, the question is, um how can we fight against terrorism uh, for Western countries? Uh, do you think that all the measures on the table are enough? Basically not. So what, what can you propose to fight against terrorism? Well, I think the first thing we have to understand is that uh, terrorism is a fact of modern life, but also that terrorism succeeds when we destroy ourselves. It's not what they do, it's what we do. Terrorism is like jujitsu in which the small player wins by making the large player use his strength against himself. And if we can learn to have uh, cautious, moderate responses, that's the first and most important thing. This is why my comment about Trump's comment about Sadiq Khan is, is to the point. But what can we do? We, we need to combine hard and soft power. We have to keep using police and military against the hardcore. We're never going to attract them. But we also have to have programs in which we attract the groups that surround them. Uh, because where do you get the intelligence from that you need for targeting the use of your hard power? In that sense, uh, we need to have a smart power strategy, both hard and soft. Why don't we turn now to some of these broader questions about the international system? I think, guys, you've got a question on that as well. Yes, you, you wrote, uh, Mr. Professor, on uh, April, my friends ask what are all Trump first steps of this means for American foreign policy and the liberal international order led by the US since 45. Frankly, you said, I don't know, but I worry less about the rise of China than the rise of Trump. Mr. Nye, you know more today now that Trump has buried multilateralism, TPP, out of the climate uh, accord? Well, if one goes back to the 2016 election, Trump was the first major presidential candidate in 75 years who called into question the system of alliances and institutions that were created after World War II. Uh, there are several dimensions to that. One are the alliances, the other are the multilateral institutions, and the third is values. On the alliances, it turns out that the bark and bite are a little different. Of the reassurance that he's given to Japan on the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, uh, the begrudging but nonetheless real 
uh, statements about NATO, it's no longer obsolete. Uh, these suggest that on the alliance structures, uh, he's not going to destroy those the way he talked about it in the campaign. Uh, unfortunately, his uh, uh, statements and actions toward the multilateral trading system are still very much up in the air. He talked about uh, 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 basically pulling out of NAFTA. Instead, he's just renegotiating. We don't know where that will go. He talked about declaring China a currency manipulator. He backed away from that, but the implicit threat of tariffs is still there. Uh, and we don't know whether he's serious about taking this attitude toward trade of bilateralism rather than multilateralism. Will that undo the World Trade Organization or not? Too early to tell. We also have institutions uh, like the uh, Paris Climate Agreement where we've seen a, uh, a, a, a decision last week, a very bad decision to uh, withdraw. On the other hand, he can't do anything about it until the day after the 2020 election. So it was really a gesture to the 25% of the American public who were his hardcore supporters. I was just covering the um, recent NATO summit in Brussels and uh, um, Mr. Trump, he didn't express his full support for the Article 5 in his speech, but was busy insisting how much money the other NATO allies owe to the US. So, and I must point out that in your recent um, article, you've mentioned the American hard and soft power stems largely from the fact that the US has 60 allies and, and on the continent, China has only a few. Well, that's, that's correct. That the, the alliance structures have been essential to American power and alliances not only produce hard power, I mean, military strength, they also produce soft power, which is a network of consultations and relations which make a country attractive to other countries. And I think what we've seen from General Mattis, the Secretary of Defense, from General McMaster, the uh, National Security Advisor, and others, is reassurance that these alliances are still crucial. Uh, and uh, they indeed have mentioned Article 5. Uh, I think there's a great deal of disappointment that when Trump said uh, that uh, even though NATO is no longer obsolete, uh, that he didn't publicly reaffirm Article 5, but uh, Madison and, and uh, McMaster did uh, do so. Uh, so I think he has wasted some soft power, but I still think that uh, uh, the alliances are going to persist. Trump in the United States, Putin in Russia, Erdogan in Turkey, Xi Jinping in China, Theresa May here in London. According to few observers, we would have entered a neo-national or neo-nationalist world. What do you think about it? Is this a turning point of globalization? Well, I don't think so, but uh, one has to be cautious to project long-term trends in history. Uh, each of these has indigenous roots. Um, uh, if we look at, uh, at the 1930s, you saw that there is a coalition of fascists and Nazis uh, uh, in Italy and Germany and then elsewhere throughout the Eastern European countries and even with some strong support in, in France. But uh, uh, there's nothing like that today. In other words, uh, you have a, the so-called alt-right, but it's, it's a fringe. And so there's no movement of neo-nationalism. And ironically, one of the things about this type of nationalism is it tends to have a self-limiting factor. If you say America first, as Trump has said, it means everybody else is second. Uh, that doesn't appeal to everybody else. Through Emmanuel, the new president, Emmanuel Macron, does Europe have uh, the means to take its destiny into its own hands? I think Europe can begin to restore some of the elan that was lost by Brexit. Uh, I, th I thought that was a mistake on the part of the British. 
But uh, if you look back at the history of Europe, going all the way back to the original six, there were many setbacks. And after a setback, there was a relance. And if, you, if Macron and Merkel can re-energize uh, uh, the, uh, the Franco-German engine at the heart of Europe, uh, you can imagine Europe doing a lot more. But how, how much space do you think there is to do that? Because people looked at Angela Merkel after Trump was elected and said, is she the leader of the, of the free world? But um, can you do that as France and Germany if you've got Xi Jinping in China, Trump in Washington, um, you know, Modi in Delhi, Putin in Moscow, Erdogan in Ankara? I mean, how much control does uh, a, country, a continent like Europe actually have over the structure of global affairs? Is this magical thinking? Well, if one looks at the economy, the European economy is actually larger than the Chinese economy. And so to the extent that Europe acts as an entity in the economic affairs, it, it carries a lot of weight. Uh, antitrust, uh, regulation of cyber events and so forth, international standards, Europe, uh, Europe does uh, pull its own weight there. If you look at defense, it's different. Uh, it's hard to imagine European publics being willing to spend uh, the, uh, uh, the amount that would be needed to have a uh, a defense at the scale of the United States, for example. And they do live in a dangerous neighborhood. So I think the U.S. relationship will be uh, critical for European defense. But Europe can play a, a bigger role by getting uh, together the French and the Germans, and I'd love to see the British come in in a new kind of saint Malo uh, arrangement in which in a number of areas in the Mediterranean, the Middle East, North Africa, uh, which is in Europe's direct interest. It would use hard power as well as soft power. Yes, but um, to organize the defense of Europe, you know that you have to change the German constitution. So how can you uh, imagine this defense of Europe with France and Germany, and that is to say changing the constitution, and without Britain? It's not well, impossible. Well, it might be. It, it, it's interesting that Germany has been able to send troops to uh, to Afghanistan, and uh, I but guess we've got arms, we we weapons. France and Britain both have expeditionary forces, which are well trained and practiced for that. It might be that the initial initial German participation in this is at, a, at something like their Afghanistan role. Still, can be very important. Important not just in uh, money and logistics but important in terms of showing the political weight of Europe. So you've written lots about power over the years and um, you pointed out rather brilliantly um, all the different aspects of power, the difference between resources and the kind of decisions that people make. And if you look at power under Donald Trump, American power under Donald Trump. How would you say that's developed? He's reduced American soft power because he's made the United States less attractive. On American hard power, there's actually uh, quite a lot there. Demographically, the United States is the only major country that will hold its position, a major developed country that will hold its position. Uh, it's also true that in the major technologies of the future, biotechnology, uh, a nanotechnology, uh, the next generation of information technology like artificial intelligence and big data, the U.S. is at the forefront. And in universities which support all this, you see that uh, Shanghai Jiao Tung University says of the 20 top universities in the world, 15 of the 20 are U.S. So will America continue to have impressive power resources? Yes. But the United States was the most powerful country after World War I, and it went home. Yeah. So if Donald Trump takes us home, uh, so to speak, or if Donald Trump turns his back on the world successfully, then all those power resources won't matter. If you 
put a question mark at, about American alliances in every single region, which he has done now. Does that not invite people to probe American power and to hedge against America going home? Even if America doesn't go home, there's a kind of seed of doubt which is sown, which wasn't there beforehand. I think that is a danger, but I also think that it has to be seen in relation to regional threats. Uh, if you look at Japan, or the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, is essential to Japanese um, uh, coping with the rise of China. I can't see the Japanese turning their backs on that. Or if you look at Europe, uh, despite the frictions and problems that have been caused by, uh, by Trump's attitudes in NATO, uh, Europe still has to deal with, uh, uh, with Putin's Russia. So I don't think the alliances are going to collapse. There may be some, some oddities like Duterte in the Philippines or something, but overall I expect the alliance uh, structure will survive Trump. You are considered uh, the father of soft power, you know, <laughs> so which seem to inspire all actors. Russia has its soft power, China, Iran, Turkey, etc. Uh, but uh, what is the future of this soft power in the hands of authoritarian leaders? Well, many authoritarian leaders have soft power. Soft power is not just the result of democracy. Soft power depends on the eye of the beholder. So uh, for some people, uh, authoritarian things are attractive. Osama bin Laden didn't uh, threaten uh, to coerce the people who flew into the World Trade Center. He didn't pay them. He attracted them with the soft power of his radical view of Islam attracted them to commit mass murder. And <coughs> I think the question of uh, can Putin use soft power, he says so. I mean, he, he claims that what he's doing, but uh, as one of my project syndicate columns said, is Putin thinks information warfare is soft power. It's not. Soft power is getting what you want by attraction, and his information warfare does not attract. China gets a certain attraction from the success of its economic performance, and justly so. But the Chinese soft power runs into problems uh, in some areas. In its neighborhood, uh, uh, China can't threaten uh, territories of its neighbors and look attractive. Erdogan, I think, uh, alas, has long lost Turkey's soft power by his actions which is ironic since his former prime minister and former foreign minister uh, Davutoglu used to talk about Turkish soft power. So I don't think the authoritarians have been very effective. It's not impossible for authoritarians to attract. Uh, alas, Hitler attracted many people in Europe in the 1930s. But I don't see any of the authoritarians today doing a very good job on soft power. Two last questions, uh, Professor Nye. The first one is, what are the major challenges in, the, in this new world shift? And um, in our century, 21st century, does the power still uh, rule the world? Well, I think we have to realize that there are two things going on at the same time. You have what I call this transition of power among countries in which China is a rising power, the Americans have been the dominant power. And the key question there is can the Americans adjust to the rise of China, avoiding war? Uh, and I think they can, but Trump has made my guess on this a little less certain than it used to be. The other uh, is power diffusion from state to non-state actors. And that's where you absolutely have to have cooperation among states, because you can't solve climate change or rules for the internet acting alone, and you can't solve them by military power. And so the United States, I think, will remain the most powerful country, but it won't be like the past 70 years. So I've argued in this little book, is the American century over? No, but it won't look at all like the American century since 1945, it's going to have to much larger component of cooperation, or what I call power with others, as opposed to just power over others.
Why don't we stick with the, the, some of these burning issues around the world? And, and you've mentioned China a few times now. That's one of the things which is a bit, a bit more confusing about Trump's policy. On one hand, you know, people were expecting a coming war with China, if not a hot war, at least a trade war with China. And then after Xi Jinping's visit to Mar-a-Lago, um, things seem to go in a slightly different direction. Uh, is Trump's confrontation with China now over? No, uh, I wish it were, uh, because uh, I still fear that uh, what he's done with Xi Jinping may come unstuck. What he did at Mar-a-Lago was, in effect, say, uh, you help me solve the problem of North Korea, and I'll back off of my trade threats against you. If you think that Xi Jinping can't solve the problem of North Korea, and Trump then says, wait a minute, I was holding off on trade because you were going to help me on this and you haven't, he might return to a more aggressive stance on China in the trade area, which could be damaging to the WTO. It's a crucial issue for obviously for Japan and uh, maybe if you can um, elaborate a bit on, on North Korea. I mean, how you think Mr. Trump would deal with North Korea? I mean, would there be a red line for him? Well, he has said that he will not have uh, a policy of strategic patience, which was the Obama policy. But it's also not clear what he can do. When you look at the military options in North Korea, they're pretty dismal. Uh, North Korea has 15,000 artillery tubes in the demilitarized zone within 30 miles of Seoul. Mm -hmm. So long before it developed nuclear weapons, it could have destroyed Seoul. That's true today or not. Mm -hmm. As for the, uh, the nuclear side, uh, trying to preempt the nuclear weapons by hitting uh, their bases or their storage places, we're not sure we know them all. And it could just also unleash this conventional deterrence, which I refer to. So the military options don't look very good, and that's well understood by people like the Secretary of Defense and right. the National Security right. Advisor. I'm not sure how well it's understood by the president. Mm -hmm. What you might imagine is that China leans hard on Kim Jong-un, uh, hard meaning the threat of cutting off food and fuel, and saying that no nuclear tests, no missile tests, and if you have either one, then there goes your food and fuel. That might, so to speak, kick the can down the road a few years. Do you think the North Korean nuclear weapon, uh, nuclear program is containable? Is it, is, it, um, is it a rational regime that will respond to the normal deterrence? Or do you I think, think they... it's, I, it's, I think it's deterrable in the sense, I, I, the argument that uh, that the North Koreans are crazy or madmen doesn't make any sense. I mean, they, they have a clear objective, which is survival of the regime, and uh, uh, they will pick patterns to preserve that. Getting into a war with the U.S., much less a nuclear war, is a guarantee of the end of the regime. So can they be deterred? I think yes. What do you think about the... Um uh, South Korea president's strategy, which is kind of soft power? Well, I think uh, Moon Jae-in is, is, uh, comes from a tradition in South Korea, the more progressive party tradition, which is sympathetic to having uh, uh, more contact with the North, uh, both economic and social. Uh, this stems from the days of Kim Dae-jong and the so-called sunshine policy. But uh, it's not clear to me how far that can go. In other words, if, if Kim Dae-jong couldn't make it work, I'm not sure that Moon Jae-in can make it work. When we see the um, decision of Mr. Trump to quit the um, Paris Agreement, um, Spotlight came on to China, and uh, clearly they seem to be eager to make use of this rather peculiar situation. Um, how do you foresee the rise of China in the um, Trump era? Obama and Xi reached agreement on climate, and that, was, that allowed the Chinese-American positions to be quite close in Paris, which was crucial because that helped to bring India along and other countries, mm -hmm. and with very adept French leadership of the 
of the uh, uh, conference overall, it meant that you had the opposite of Copenhagen. Copenhagen is generally a failure. Paris, I think, was generally a success. Uh, so that's an illustration that China can help to pick up or can change its attitudes and can help to pick up some of the public goods uh, that are needed for a global public goods. On the rise of China more generally, uh, I think China has continued to rise. I think it will, I expect Chinese growth will continue, albeit at a slower pace than in the past. And I think the key question is, can the US and China adjust to cooperation in the production of public goods? And uh, I think we were making progress on that. Whether that can contribute in the future uh, depends on Xi being able to control his domestic politics, which he's in a position or better position to do, but also whether Trump can be limited in terms of this uh, uh, anti-multilateral approach that he's taking. And I think the question of whether we're at a hinge of history in which uh, things are going to turn downward or whether we'll look back in 2020 and see the Trump years as an aberration, uh, I bet on the f fact that we'll see Trump as an aberration, but I wouldn't bet the mortgage of my house on it. <laughs> and the reason is because they're unpredictable things, like suppose you have another 9-11. Yeah. How will that affect attitudes? So one of the more predictable things that we've been talking about for a long time is, is the Iran nuclear deal. I think you wanted to, to ask oh, a question yeah. on that. I'm in the G7 summit, apparently the G7 leaders, they couldn't convince Trump to not to abandon the Paris Agreement. And this makes one worried that uh, if the other leaders can, you know, um, convince Trump not to abandon this time the Iran deal. And if one looks at the Iran agreement, what's most interesting mm -hmm. is that Trump, though he criticized it harshly in the campaign, has mm -hmm. not uh, broken out of it yet. Mm -hmm. Now, partly this is because uh, the Europeans would continue trade with Iran, mm -hmm. but also I think he's being advised uh, by some of the people around him that uh, this would be costly and counterproductive. Um, it's interesting that Trump has gone back on many of his pledges, mm. uh, and this seems to be one that he's gone back on so far. I mean, he didn't declare China currency manipulator on day one, just to give yeah. a clear example. Yeah. Yeah. On the other hand, um, it doesn't mean he won't in the future. Mm. But uh, do you think uh, with against Iran, it's uh, only um, uh, ideological confrontation or a first step in the large, more large strategy? Well, his trip to Saudi Arabia suggests that he is uh, going to place more bets on the Sunni Arabs, mm -hmm. and he sees them as crucial in his top priority, which is the fight against ISIS. And, uh, uh, and the Saudis, of course, have a strong fixation about uh, Iran. Um, and so I think Trump, uh, uh, it, it probably has a more hostile view of Iran, let's say, than Obama did. But uh, thus far, it hasn't led to uh, uh, destroying the Iran uh, agreement. Uh, whether, uh, whether it will in the future, I think, is still open. Mm. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for answering all our questions, taking us all the way around the world and spreading so much light and uh, understanding in these difficult areas. And thank you to you for watching PS On Air.